Hey, this is Blonde Guy Gamer, and welcome to another Black Sheep Game Review. It only took me about... over a year, but we're now in the last game for the voting choices. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, and it's... It's a Black Sheep for very good reasons. And it's one from a pretty popular game series, Fallout. If you're not too familiar with the franchise, Fallout is a series that takes place in a retro-futuristic post-nuclear apocalypse in which humanity struggles to survive in a wasteland that was once the United States, now full of bandits, mutated creatures, and other hazards brought about from the aftermath of nuclear war. The first Fallout came out on PC back in 1997 by Interplay as a spiritual successor of sorts to the company's own wasteland, which had a similar premise. The game was a success with its unique RPG formula and gameplay, and a sequel was made the following year with the developers now Black Isle Studios. However, we wouldn't get another main entry until Bethesda's Fallout 3 in 2008, which, like a fair amount of people, was the first Fallout game I played. I know Fallout purists may scoff a little at 3, and accuse me of being too casual to talk about Fallout for liking and playing 3 first, on a console no less, but this was still a good introduction to the series as I did want to check out the first two Fallouts and also get New Vegas developed by Obsidian that came out afterwards in 2010. Not only that, but I ended up getting all the Fallout games, even the more obscure ones. In the 10 year gap between 2 and 3, there were a couple spin-off games that came out, both of which focus on the Brotherhood of Steel, an organization in the games that seek to preserve civilization and technology. Basically, a technological knightly order of sorts in Fallout's post-apocalypse. While still generally a good faction that you can become a part of in some of the games, the Brotherhood of Steel's main ideology often puts preservation over actually helping people in the wastelands. As a result, some parts of the Brotherhood went on their own agendas and became more directly involved, with the premise for these two particular games having you play as Brotherhood of Steel initiates. One being Fallout Tactics Brotherhood of Steel, which is usually just referred to as Fallout Tactics to avoid confusion, released in 2001 by 14 Degrees East and Microforte on the PC. Tactics is more of a squad-based strategy game with Fallout mechanics and is the more known and highly regarded spin-off, even being bundled with the first two games as a trilogy. The other spin-off is Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, which was made solely by Interplay and came out in 2004 on the PlayStation 2 and original Xbox, making this the only Fallout game not on the PC. It's also the only Fallout that does not have a Ron Perlman opening narration about war never changing and no person in some kind of intimidating power armor on the game covers and title screens. Instead, we just have two of the playable main characters in rather stock poses on the cover and the menu in a diner giving us a glimpse at the bad character models. That's only scratching the surface as when we get into this game you'll see why this is the fall of Black Sheep. And also not be surprised why Interplay sold the franchise rights to Bethesda after what they did with this. Because trust me, this is... something, alright. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel takes place in the year 2208, in between Fallout 1 and 2, where you play as one of three initiates to look for members of the Brotherhood of Steel in the small town of Carbon, Texas. Your choices are Cyrus, the strongest but least agile of the three, Nadia, who can't use the largest weapons but is more nimble, and absent from the cover, Kane, who is more balanced as he can still equip heavy guns but isn't as strong or dexterous as the other two. He's also a ghoul, which are people mutated to zombie-like beings from radiation in the series. If you actually know the Brotherhood of Steel, they're not exactly keen on mutated species. Although in Fallout Tactics, ghouls and even Super Mutants, ironically, could be recruited, but even then that is technically a different Brotherhood group and in the main campaign you had to be a human anyway. In Brotherhood of Steel, Kane became an initiate simply by persisting the Brotherhood enough to let him join. I guess he must have gotten really high charisma and speech points to pull that off. I also want to mention that while you could choose preset characters in the previous games, Brotherhood of Steel is the only Fallout you can't create a character in. So when you first start out the game, you have to choose between these three. And since you immediately begin the game when you select a character without some kind of bio description first, I played through the game as Nadia since the cursor was on her first and just rolled with it. There is a separate tutorial mode that is recommended to play through first, which naturally teaches you the basics of the game. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel's gameplay is more top-down action RPG compared to the others, particularly in its combat. You attack with various melee weapons, guns, and throwable explosives, all of which you can equip to up to three slots that allows you to cycle between them with the L2 and R2 buttons on the fly. With melee weapons, all you really need to do is mash X and can also do a charge attack by holding the circle button and releasing it when it meter is full. Though you can't do those until you put skill points into a specific melee perk. More on those later. With longer range weapons, it's best to use the R1 button to lock onto an enemy to shoot at. The only problems being that you move quite slow in aiming and you can't easily switch to another target while locking on, which makes things cumbersome with multiple enemies. Nadia's specialty is being able to run around while shooting smaller guns, but she's still slow in targeting, so trying to aim while running around is loose and not nearly as effective as using R1. Throwing explosives also isn't as effective as you would think because you need to awkwardly hold the X button and release to throw it where the indicator shows it will go. And since explosives usually take a few seconds to detonate, I didn't use them all that much except for the occasional attempt to take out groups of enemies, which only works sometimes. 
Other abilities include a jump with the triangle button you won't need to use very often, being able to evade roll by pressing a direction in the triangle button while holding R1, which helps while aiming, but there's still no good middle ground between that and the slow strafing, and toggling between standing and crouching with down on the directional pad. Though unlike the cover in pro instances and follow tactics, crouching is barely utilized in all of Brotherhood of Steel as there's no cover or stealth mechanics to take advantage of and it's only really necessary late in the game to duck under security lasers. With the rest of the controls, there is using health recovery stim packs with the L1 button, left on the D-pad to change the minimap size, and the right analog stick to move the camera, but only spinning it left or right. I don't like the camera angle very much because it's too overhead and zoomed in for my liking and you can't adjust that. This limits your view distance quite a bit, relying on focusing on the minimap for navigation most of the time, and rotating the camera only disorients the area orientation. Enemies can also take pot shots at you from across the map, but you won't be able to see or target them effectively until they're on screen. Close quarter combat will still work, but it's a little clunky as you can't move and attack at the same time, even with someone like Cyrus. But as long as you maintain your health and have decent equipment, you can just rush up to most baddies and wail on them until they die. Even when you're completely surrounded, spinning around in place and mashing X with a strong enough weapon is a viable strategy. Defeating foes and completing quests rewards you with experience points as indicated by the green bar below your health. When filled, you level up and earn points to put into various skills, which is the closest thing this game has to perks and skill sets from the other games. Since it uses a rather ordinary skill point level up system, Brotherhood of Steel does not use a series special system or any of the skill sets like science or lockpicking. Because of that, there aren't really any multiple solutions to quests like in the other Fallout games, which makes the entirety of Brotherhood of Steel unimaginative in comparison, especially when the game is mostly a linear affair. One of the biggest draws for any Fallout game is being able to explore the vast wastelands of post-nuclear apocalypse. Not so much in Brotherhood of Steel. The main quest line is quite linear and there's only a few optional side missions that are just fetch quests and arena battles for extra experience points and money along the way. The most exploring you ever do is run around every part of an area bashing boxes and opening things you come across to find items, ammo, and bottle caps for currency. Buying things from traders or stores is also pretty straightforward compared to the trade the other Fallout games have. These only serve to provide a faster or more convenient way to get more weaponry and items that you can usually find later on your own anyway. Which means you don't have to buy anything, but you might as well since that's all bottle caps are mostly used for and sell the less powerful and multiples of weapons and armor anyway. And no, there isn't a limit to how much weapons and things you can buy, sell, and carry like in all the other Fallout games. Honestly, my biggest gripe with the gameplay is that it's not very challenging, at least on the normal difficulty. For a game that's supposed to take place in a world where supplies are hard to come by, this game gives you a ton of bottle caps, weapons, armor pieces, ammo, and stim packs in just about every nook and cranny, as well as sometimes dropped from enemies. Even when playing the game somewhat recklessly and using stim packs fairly frequently, I still ended up with well over 100 stim packs by the end of the game. Meaning that with the exception of instant death things like falling to pits or running to lasers, as long as I continue to level up decent skills, get better equipment, and find a seemingly never-ending supply of stim packs, I rarely have to worry about dying. And if you do die, you just load the last made save point from these... phone booths? Computer stations? I don't know. Which will be all too easy because these things are everywhere, sometimes with three or four of them in a single area alone. I understand having a convenient save system, but this is too convenient. Do we really need a save station at the end of an area only to have another one at the beginning of the next anyway? We don't need this many save points! So because of the lack of actual game challenge, Brotherhood of Steel quickly becomes mundane and not all that fun. The most entertaining thing I found, albeit unintentionally, was enemies with bad AI killing each other, themselves, or doing... this. The only thing that did feel engaging was managing your weapons to balance between melee and shooting combat. You do get a decent arsenal that is pretty conventional, with a few of the later game ones being more futuristic. For certain types of guns, they have different kinds of ammo to collect, which can be easy to burn through, especially with automatic and dual handguns, the latter of which only appear in this Fallout game. But as long as you hold off using one category of gun for a while, you can end up collecting, or even buy, hundreds of rounds to plow through sections of bosses with. It defeats any strategy this game has, if it had any to begin with. All the other Fallout games combat allowed careful playing and was sometimes required, even being able to pick off specific parts of foes to attack. Hell, the newer Fallout still implemented that aspect with that. But of course, Brotherhood of Steel doesn't do that. It's just the same mindless shooting and hitting things over and over. With how much this game isn't followed, it might as well be another game entirely. Then I found that this is pretty much a half-assed clone of another game that used the same engine. Snowblind Studios Dark Alliance engine to be exact, that was used in the Baldur's Gate game of the same name. I haven't played the Dark Alliance games, but simply looking up footage of the first one made me realize that they just took everything from that game. Right down to the user interface, combat, collecting items, equipment screen, you name it. 
It's bad enough what was done with Fallout and Brotherhood of Steel, but they blatantly copy-pasted Dark Alliance design here. Sure, Fallout 3 could be described as Oblivion with guns, but Bethesda at least managed to take a design similar to their Elder Scrolls games and make it work with Fallout in my opinion. With Brotherhood of Steel, it's just Dark Alliance with guns and not much else. Just a vague Fallout skin over it. And despite Interplay publishing Dark Alliance and partially owning the game engine, they apparently used it without Snowblind Studios' consent, which led to legal action. Something that Interplay is all too familiar with. We haven't even gotten to the lovely story this game has to offer, but I assure you that even if I treated this game as its own without the fall comparisons, it's just a mediocre Ballas Gate Dark Alliance clone. Just from that alone, this is a pretty pointless and unfulfilling game to slog through, made even more so with being able to play this game with a second player, making this the lone Fallout game with multiplayer. The only real benefit to having another player is to access a couple areas I found late in the game with simultaneous switches for more loot, but there was no way I was going to force someone to play with me that far just for that. There really isn't any need for the two-player co-op as it's just tacked on. So, believe it or not, despite my complaints with the general gameplay so far, it's actually the best part of the game. What's worse is what transpires throughout this spin-off of Fallen and, um, Let's just say if you're a fan of the series like me, you might get a little... baffled at what was done with the Fallout name here. The only reassurance being that since Bethesda took the rights, they declared Brotherhood of Steel completely non-canon. So yeah, this is a spin-off in the series that takes place in between the first two main games and was later deemed non-canon. Doesn't that sound familiar? As I said before, the game starts off with you looking for Brotherhood of Steel Paladins in the town of Carbon. We get our first look at the locals to talk to and... Oh boy, this is certainly the first 3D follow game, alright. Going back to Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, look at this. This is a game that came out around 2001, 2002, and it holds up way better visually. Look at the talking with the people here. They actually have smooth animation and detail put into them. And when you compare this to Fallout Brotherhood of Steel... I'm, uh, Richard, the mayor of Carbon. I also can't move anything besides my mouth. It's like the monkeys that programmed this game couldn't be bothered to give me animations. Yeah, I'm sorry, but if you're going to practically steal the game engine and copy Dark Alliance, at least try and make it so you aren't talking to statues during conversations. I mean, for crying out loud, the character portraits in Fallout 1 and 2 looked better than this. I've seen less stiff animation from old Chuck E. Cheese animatronics. The rest of the game fortunately doesn't look as bad when not focused on talking mannequins. The dull color scheme is a given for the setting, but the game looks... average at best, as the creature and art design is mostly bland looking with hardly any of the signature style the series is known for. Anyway, after dealing with some readers in the main menu bar, we get acquainted with the locals who are perhaps some of the most uninteresting and least charming characters in the Fallout universe. There's the local prostitute Ruby we met before, who can give you services for a few caps, which is a waste of time and money. And you can get this service even if you're Nadia or Kane. Well, at least he doesn't discriminate same sex and ghoul sex. There's the bar owner Armpit, who is just as pleasant to talk to as his name is, since his one-dimensional characteristic is constantly making gross noises. I'm put at your service. What can I do for you? <laughs> then there's the one-armed trader Jesse, who is pretty self-explanatory, and the town doctor named Vidya. Great, even in a 2004 game, I can't escape internet slang. Might as well make the old meme joke. Yo, dog, we heard you like Vidya, so we put a Vidya in your Vidya. Eh. Besides having an unfortunate name for bad internet jokes, she was a member of the Followers of the Apocalypse, which might sound familiar from the other games, and can heal you for free, which you'll most likely won't need to. Lastly, there is the Carbon Mayor Richard I already poked fun at earlier, who is at the mercy of the Raiders and their over-sexualized matron leader, Jane. Before the mayor can help us find the Brotherhood members, we have to clear a warehouse full of rat scorpions. Because beginning RPG quests. But first, I should mention that the dialogue options with the characters in this game are quite limited compared to the rest of the series. Most of the voice acting at least isn't half bad, but there really aren't any intricate dialogue trees or anything like that. Plus, between the three playable characters, there isn't much of a difference in the general dialogue. I did find a couple choices that led to the mayor giving me cats when threatening them, and just to give me a small discount after telling the mayor that he's letting the Raiders be their bitch. But these options are pale imitations of the speech systems from the other fallouts and how they can affect those games. And there isn't a karma system as far as I can tell, which was another factor in the other games and how you played. You could be a helpful good person, or make an evil character and be a complete dick to add to the role-playing aspect. But in Brotherhood of Steel, you're just stuck as a smug asshole with no real semblance of moral choices. Back with that warehouse, we need to kill a lot of rat scorpions as well as contend with giant rats. I already mentioned the overall design is linear, but the level designs themselves leave a little to be desired. There's bright red explosive barrels you can blow up in a few breakable walls, but most areas in the game are just corridors or open areas, with obstacles now and then to make things a little more annoying. Such as landmines that you can't seem to get rid of safely even when you throw explosives on them, and radioactive material that if you touch directly, you glow green and have your health drained for a short time, unless you have Kane's specific skill for healing from it instead. This is not how radiation works, or ever worked in the Fallout games. 
Also, catching on fire pretty much does the same thing, complete with your character not showing much concern over it. Levels usually give you some arbitrarily simple objective or area puzzle to complete that only serve to drag out sections longer than they should be, such as needing to find crane controls to move a crate that's in your way in the warehouse. Eventually, you kill the rat scorpions except this giant one that appears as the first boss, and the game, rather unintuitively, gives us a hint in a text box on how to destroy its claws. Even without hints like that, fighting the boss, or any boss in the game for that matter, can be easily dealt with by constantly shooting and invading to keep your distance, or just bum rushing while using your near infinite supply of stim packs. They're made even more anticlimactic when heavy metal music starts playing during each boss fight. And it's not something that was composed for this game either. It's actually instrumental versions of licensed songs from bands like Slipknot, Killswitch Engage, and Skin Lab to name a few. I'm not saying this kind of music is bad, but it's not suited for Fallout at all. The soundtracks in the other games reflected the dire world and atmosphere accordingly. They were bleak and melancholy, with Golden Oli style music, mostly in the intros, to suit the retro futuristic setting. It's a very stark contrast to the modern punk rock and Brotherhood of Steel that tries to make the lackluster boss fights epic set pieces. Could you imagine getting to a boss in another game and then all of a sudden licensed metal music started playing during them? Now, to be fair, the rest of the soundtrack does fit better with the followed aesthetic. The main menu theme is the closest this game has to a Golden Oldie song, and the ambient tracks are more reminiscent of the older games, some I even liked to a degree. However, those don't seem to last very long as I'll often just stop and then play again later for seemingly no reason. Possible technical issues aside, the traditional portion of the soundtrack only sets the boss music further apart from the rest of the game. Then again, licensing metal bands is only the beginning. In what is perhaps the most blasphemous thing to do in Fallout, they replace Nuka Cola, a fictional drink in the series universe, with Balls, a legitimately real energy drink despite the name. This kind of product placement is downright cartoonish. It reeks of slimy marketing to try and appeal to the console gamer audience at the time. And before you ask, no, I have never drank or seen balls before. And I don't think it's sold in Canada even if I wanted to try. And I'm gonna refrain from making balls jokes because I would be stooping down this game's level of humor. Hey, are you looking at that... that hooker? Well, I, I wasn't staring at her. Just her tits. Honest. Have your balls dropped yet? Yeah, months ago. Yours? Yeah, mine fell off just now. Wanna help me look for him? Sure. When God do the over, Bob, we have to go body. Okay, okay. You go, I'll stay. No! Between moments like that and the constant swearing and ash holeless things your character says, the tone of the game is obnoxious. These kind of things was interplay woefully thinking this is what console gamers wanted in a Fallout game. I have a hard time fathoming what the actual type of gamer interplay was trying to market this game to. Dude, don't be such a lame-o! This game is awesome! It's got my favorite energy drink in it, and the music is so metal! And all we want is more metal! Oh good, another old character I thought I killed off a few years ago is back as a ghost or something. Remind me to exercise my room again after this review. So after the rat scorpion extermination, the mayor tells us the Brotherhood Paladins went down into the town crater, which turns out to be a trap by Richard as he was promised by the raiders that they'll spare his town if he takes care of the initiate for what we did back to the members of the bar. If this were a proper Fallout game, we could maybe talk him out of it as an option, but we can't have the speech skill in this game, we'll miss it on the amazing boss fights. Makes even having dialogue choices meaningless at this point. So yeah, we kill the mayor and backtrack all the way to Carbon, dealing with more raiders along the way because the level design is lazy and the town is already being attacked. And they kill Armpit. Oh no, not Armpit. Who will make disgusting noises now? Some of the other townsfolk took shelter in the warehouse, but Video won't let us in until we kill all the raiders in town and rescue as many people as we can. So that means we have to go through the entire town, which apparently has several areas we need to go through and make it busy work. Here, what the... His name was Robert Paulson? Uh, okay, sure, just throw in a Fight Club reference. Why not? I think at this point I'd rather play the Fight Club game. Ah, on second thought, maybe not. With that taken care of, we're able to go into the warehouse and get Jesse to take us towards the Raiders' hideout, which is in a steel mill and Jane hangs out in the northern part of it because she likes the machinery vibrations. Ah, could this game be any more immature? 
But before we can get to her, we need to deactivate some mechanisms to unlock the area she's in. When we do get there, the Raider Matron is making a deal, facing the wrong way for some reason, selling slaves to a certain mutant army leader named Addis, who is the main antagonist of the game. He's pretty much just a copy of the Lieutenant Super Mutant from the first Fallout, right down to being voiced by Tony J as well, who is also incidentally the intro narrator of this game instead of Ron Perlman. When the deal is interrupted by the Initiate's action, Addis pieces out, but not before he finds Jane repulsive for selling her own kind after she offers herself for his help. Wait, then why are you buying slaves from her if you find that... Ugh, we're only introduced to the main villain now and there's already a contradiction. With that, we can now converse with Jane in all of her S&M bimbo glory. Hmm, yes, nice idle animation there. I see they're willing to animate... those the most out of any character animation. Oh, and she's practically the same character model used for Ruby, and the same voice actress too. Nice to know that a third of the female characters in this game are just interchangeable polygonal sex dolls. Dude, don't be such a queer man! These bears are bodacious! They've got huge boobs! I will go Ghostbusters on your ass if you don't shut up! Whoa, 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 okay. Just chill out. I'll, I'll be cool. I'll be cool. Talking with Jane reveals that she was actually working with the Brotherhood and helping the Paladins get information on Addis's Super Mutant Army, because trusting Raiders for information is something the Brotherhood would do. After that chat, we kill Balloon Tits by shooting or hitting her a million times even though she practically has no armor. We then return to town to head towards the ghoul city of Loss, which is where the Brotherhood group went to. We get escorted to the city by the Wandering Stranger, a person we can actually meet earlier, though who he actually is will make you realize why this game was made non-canon. If you find a Vault 13 flask, that's in Texas for some reason, and give it to him as a side quest, he'll get sentimental over it. That additional conversations reveal that he is the original Vault Dweller from Fallout 1. Besides taking you to Lost, he serves no other purpose other than to desperately try and tie this game into the Fallout timeline, which failed anyway. Although if you manage to save everyone back in the town attack, he will reward you with a special BB gun. That I didn't get because a few civilians actually got killed in the crossfire. Oh, and don't worry, there's a couple more Fallout characters to meet in Lost that I'm sure won't make fans weep. Leaving Carbon and getting to Loss ends the first chapter, which there are only three of, thankfully. Most of the ghouls in Loss are under a cult called the Church of Lost and are hostile, but a few in the beginning area will still be friendly towards you. Uh-oh. Considering how good the character models have been so far in this game, I'm afraid to see what the ghouls here look like. Welcome to my humble market! Yeah, his head looks like it's made of silly putty! And they didn't even bother animating his mouth while talking! We can also meet up with the next fall character that doesn't really belong here, Harold, a recurring mutant character in the series. And here, uh, he looks awful. Well, he never looked that good to begin with, but his character model is terrible and he sounds nothing like he does in the other games. More questions, huh? Well, I'd be glad to help you. Ask away. Harold isn't lost because he, no pun intended, lost body parts we can find as a side quest, and that's all Harold is for in this game. Another failed attempt at fan pandering. After going through the city, we eventually get to the last of the shoehorn follow characters in this game, Rhombus. He was the Brotherhood of Steel's head paladin in the first Fallout, and in Brotherhood of Steel, he's the leader of a Brotherhood expedition to take out Ass's army since the remnants of the Master's suit mutant army from the first game. Even though the Brotherhood members in Fallout Tactics were originally tracking down the Master's remaining army, but hey, why not retcon even more of them for another game? Also, Rhombus looks nothing like his older portrait in the ending of Fallout 1, and is wearing some weird-looking power armor. Is that a cape? The fuck? So we find Rhombus tied up on a wall and explains that he was tracking down the army and lost, and that everyone except himself and the squad has been wiped out by the ghouls and super mutants. This means that in a game called Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, not kind of yourself as initiates, where the first half of the game is tracking down the Brotherhood of Steel, Rhombus is the only member in this entire game you ever see. The Brotherhood is barely even in this. The reason Rhombus is held up here is that he found and hid a car key for a secret vault called the secret vault, and that Addison and his army are looking for something in there. Then we have to kill the leader of the cult, and Rhombus will take us to where he hid the keycard. It basically boils down to an escort mission, every gamer's favorite. Except he didn't seem to die or anything even when his health bar was depleted, but considering how he rushes up to everything, it would be infuriating to actually try and protect him. This is also the closest this game has to having a companion with you like in the other Fall games, not including the two-player mode. Although you can get a skill that allows a dog companion, similar to the dog meat dogs from Fallout 1 and 3, but it can die pretty quickly. Fortunately, it comes back after touching a safe point. Are these, like, Vita Chambers from Bioshock? That's not my best guess for these things, since that's how you revive a player if one of them dies in two-player. Well, regardless, considering how many save points there are, you really don't have to worry about the dog much. Back with Rhombus, he gets to where the card is, but is ambushed by a suicide ghoul bomber. Wait, he's back up! He's fine! Oh, no, never mind, it's just the game being badly programmed. Once we deal with the wave of kamikaze ghouls, the wounded Rhombus gives us the key and passes away. Or out? 
Either way, his 10 minutes of screen time is over and we head over to the Vault Tech building where the secret vault entrance is. Once we deal with some turrets, we get inside the vault for the third chapter, which has certain mutants running amok. Also robots. After some more boring area puzzles and objectives, one of which lets you control a small robot to somehow activate a switch, we finally get to fight Addis, who wants our keycard to access the vault's laboratory. But even though we kick his ass, we get knocked out and Ash slices an arm off and throws us into the ruins of the vault, because just straight up killing us would make too much sense. Thankfully, we get help from a vault citizen named Mary, but because of our lack of an arm, we are now losing health at a fast rate and can only wield single-handed weapons. I'll admit, this part does change the gameplay a little bit, but that's all the credit I'll give this game for. Shortly after somehow not dying from massive blood loss, we wake up in the garden, a secluded area of the vault, and given a new arm. We are introduced to the rest of the vault people, but most importantly the head of security, Patty. She tells us that in order to leave the vault from where they are, the auxiliary events need to be opened, but we need to escort a technician and help activate them. Once that's done, we're offered to leave with the others, but we still need to kill those pesky super mutants. Since they're heading down towards the lab, we need a key from the lead scientist, who is in the vault ruins. Going through death claws and a dumb door puzzle involving shooting a switch at an awkward angle later, we find the lead scientist named Dubois, who is wounded but looks more like he had a burger with a lot of ketchup, warning us about the mother death claw. She is blind, but once she hears any noise, she will attack. Our conversation will surely bring her running. And yet he makes no real attempt to be quieter while talking and continues to do so even though it knows it can hear him. God, this game is idiotic. Oh no, I am dead. Maybe if I whisper instead, I'd still be alive. So, Mother Deathclaw boss. She looks more like a xenomorph queen and can heal herself from radioactive waste. Taking care of her gets us the key to the lab access from the garden, which, surprise surprise, the super moons have now invaded in. Now that we can go into lab, we can get to Addis again. But not before dealing with more crap to drag this game out even further and last minute attempts to add variety. Like being able to control turrets to take out a few super mutants, but with this camera angle it's hard to even see the damn things and one time a super mutant was stuck on top and even when I got him off, the game bugged out and I couldn't kill him with the turret. Wonderful. You also fight an adolescent deathclaw even though it's way bigger than the mother for some reason. Then you need a passcode for some door, but I couldn't figure that out. I did get a ring that has something engraved on it, but didn't find a way to see what it was, so I just used a walkthrough to get the code number because I'm getting sick of this game. After killing a bunch of super mutant mini bosses, one of which is literally mini, we finally reach Addis. Again. It turns out the so-called weapon in this vault is a strand of the Force Evolutionary Virus, which made the super mutants to begin with that Addis hoped would cure his race of being sterile. He injected the strand into himself hoping it would work, but it didn't and is only mutating him further. And so begins the final climactic battle. However, before we can finish him off, he mutates into a giant mass of... stuff... and is consuming the vault. Effectively making him a lame ripoff of the master from the first game as well. So now we have to kill his giant eyeball that takes a million years to do so. Then this mutant, well, penis mouth that has a really long and annoying attack that sucks you in and eats you. And after that, Addis becomes Andros from Star Fox 64 and goes on about wanting to become everything or some crap. And it was given unto the beast to make war with his hits, to overcome him. Only I have the brains to rule my life. D really? Another wall penis mouth? Ugh, enough of this game already. Just end. Oh, of course it's not over after the second one. We run into Patty, who is beaten in alive, but looks more like an action figure stuck in a hunk of Play-Doh. She tells us we can self-destruct the vault and take a Deus Ex Machina monorail to escape. Well, sir, there's nothing on Earth like a genuine bona fide electrified six-car monorail. And we mercy kill her, which rewards us with experience points. Hooray for moral ambiguity! Okay, so let's get to the monorail. Are you kidding me? We have to fight a third stupid penis mouth! God, die! 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 So we can end this atrocity already! I will glitch through you if I have to make this end! Just end! Fallout Brotherhood uh, of Steel. Let me sing about how I really feel. I didn't think this would be that bad of a game, but it turned out to be pretty dumb and lame. It is boring, no exploring, no targeting like bats. I had more fun playing with my cats. <laughs> So after the final, 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 final boss, we activate the nuclear self-destruct, but it's really easy to just run to the end and escape in the monorail.
on you. Don't. Oh, finally, the credits. Which has Slipknot's people equals shit playing. That would actually be appropriate if said people are the developers. And to add insult to injury to fans, the end of the credits list follow community sites duck and cover and no means allowed and thanks them for all the laughs. Both sites are indeed still around, with duck and cover being a .cx instead of a .net, but neither of them lists Brotherhood of Steel on the main pages and the only mention of the game is in the archive forums, where it's widely referred to as Fallout Piece of Shit. Yeah, who's laughing now? It took about 12 hours to finish this, and while it's a short follow game and didn't give you much trouble, it still felt like an eternity. You do unlock a few things like an apocalypse difficulty mode and some concept art videos, one of which is all the female characters as gratuitous pin-up drawings. You know, it's funny, the internet is tearing itself apart over uncivil arguments on feminism discussion in video games recently, and here I played a game that legitimately has a poor and juvenile representation of its women, but simply pointing that out puts me at risk of getting caught in that drama shitstorm. How timely. Although it's not as bad as something like Ride to Hell Retribution, but this is still pretty blatant. There is also a Skin Lab music video with Brotherhood of Steel spliced in. All that does is remind me of the music video from Star Wars Republic Commando, one of many games I wish I played instead. The most substantial unlocks are additional playable characters with different stat bonuses. These include Patty after completing Chapter 1, even though you don't meet her until the third chapter, Rhombus after 2, and the Vault Dweller when you beat the game. These characters don't really add much other than being ultimate skins. In fact, Patty is a reskin of Nadia. What's up with this game and reusing female character models this poorly? Playing the other two main characters only have minor differences and a few unique skills to level up, so I have no good reason to replay the game with any other characters and don't want to. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel is an example of a worst case scenario for a game in a series to suddenly try and sell out to the teenage male demographic above all else. The liberties made with the Fallout name are ludicrous and not thought out well at all. It's like a bad fanfiction. If you like Fallout, don't play this. If you haven't played Fallout before, don't play this, play any of the other ones. Or Wasteland 2 that just came out. From a playability standpoint, while Brotherhood of Steel is not absolutely terrible, it gets tedious pretty fast. You're better off with something like Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance if you want a console action RPG. Interplay really dropped the ball on this one, to the point where Brotherhood of Steel 2 was even being planned before the first one was finished. Of course, after the fan reactions and not great reviews and sales, Interplay went into even more financial troubles and the sequel was cancelled, with the series rights eventually being sold to Bethesda, with followed online rights and being able to sell the older titles also acquired by Bethesda more recently. Oh, and let's not forget Black Isle Studios getting laid off and their own Fallout 3, coding Van Buren, being cancelled in favor of Brotherhood of Steel. Then again, when Titus, makers of such gems like Superman 64 and Robocop on the Xbox, gain majority control over Interplay with shareholder investments, it's no surprise that these decisions to try and help its finances didn't do a whole lot of good in the long run. And even when Titus went to fuck in 2005, one of its founders became the CEO of Interplay and is still somehow keeping the company alive, when I'm pretty sure they've had more lawsuits than games made in the past 10 years. While I am curious to how Von Buren would have turned out, I can't say Interplay didn't deserve losing Fallout after this game. Non-canon spin-off or not, this is a big stain on Fallout and it's no wonder why hardly anyone talks about it when the series is mentioned. Hopefully a Fallout 4 will be officially announced sometime soon so I can put this game even further behind me. Ugh, it felt like my soul was being drained while playing this game. And this has been the fourth Black Sheep in a row that's turned out bad or disappointing. I really need to review a better game as a Black Sheep again because those are few and far between shit like this. So I'll see you all next time for another Black Sheep game review. Well, a piece of shit indeed. A lonely electron with nothing to do. Pairs up with the neutron for a cocktail or two. Tommy kisses, so far by a few. They had a nuclear blast. Said the electron to the neutron, you sure could be dense. There's much attraction, there's no civil defense. Let go of that energy. No need to be tense, give me that nuclear blast. Einstein said that space is elastic. Twist his theory, it comes out bombastic. A mushroom cloud, a sight fantastic. Stick your head between your legs, kiss your ass goodbye. A happy electron, a neutron in space. Don't give a damn about apocalyptic fate. They party till midnight, then boom, it's too late. It's a nuclear blast. <laughs>